Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the VSCN April webinar. Thank you very much for your attendance. I'm Bruce Campbell, presenter today. Sonia Denisenko sends her apologies. She's just um, delayed somewhere else. But um, please remember to fill out the exit survey so that we can uh, track attendance and continue to improve the program. So my job today is to talk to you about acute stroke management and prevention and thanks to some of you who've uh, put in feedback about what you'd like to hear today, hopefully I'll cover it. And if you want to ask questions, please put them in the message box as we go along and then when we get to the end, hopefully I'll have time to answer a few for you. So the outline today is I'm going to talk about thrombolysis and endovascular clot retrieval, including some aspects of workflow and optimising use of the Victorian Stroke Telemedicine Program and imaging. I'm going to talk about investigations for stroke etiology and how that can guide management and secondary prevention and the standard elements of secondary prevention. Just to start off with what we, what we have these days, um, our senior colleagues, uh, Jeff Donnans and Steve Davis, would like to show a slide of acute stroke interventions with evidence base in 1977 when they started stroke, and it's a blank slide. And of course now we have several proven therapies, and the basis of it all is stroke unit care. So I'm not going to speak a lot about stroke unit care today, but it is the bedrock of everything we do, and it reduces uh, morbidity and mortality in any type of stroke of any uh, severity in any age group, so it really is uh, what we need to do. Uh, ischemic stroke has TPA within four and a half hours. I'm going to spend quite a lot of time talking about the evidence and the issues with TPA. Thrombectomy within six hours currently, although as I'll show you that will probably change. Aspirin, the other end of the spectrum, small effect but applicable to a lot of people. Uh, hemicraniectomy, big effect but applicable to very few people. Um, it's worth knowing about for the rural sites because you'll need to transfer people into a neurosurgical centre. And then with intracerebral haemorrhage, other than stroke unit care, we really only have blood pressure lowering acutely to a target of 140 millimetres of mercury, which has a small effect on morbidity. Pathophysiology of stroke is always good just to start off with. So if you block your middle cerebral artery, there are some areas that have very little collateral supply, no alternative source of blood flow, if you like, no natural bypass vessels and that will die very rapidly over a few minutes probably. And that particularly applies to this deep lenticulostriate territory uh, supplying the internal capsule particularly, which is, is relevant to function. The rest of that territory, to a variable degree from you to me to someone else, will have a degree of collateral supply. And that may be enough to keep the tissue ticking over metabolically, but probably not electrically functioning. Uh, as the ischemic penumbra, the salvageable bit that if we can rapidly open the artery, it springs back to life and the patient's deficit gets better in front of you. Now the reason for the existence of that penumbra, as I said, is collateral flow. You have anterior cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery leptomeningeal collaterals uh, with this position uh, blockage in the artery. Obviously you can also have circular Willis collaterals if the artery is blocked more proximally. So over time, what tends to happen is that core of irreversibly injured tissue grows into the salvageable penumbra and you no longer have salvageable tissue after several hours, which varies from person to person. So the rationale for stroke thrombolysis is, of course, to get that artery open as quickly as possible. If you think about the situation in an angio suite where someone might be calling an aneurysm and they accidentally block an artery, um, if you get that open quickly, you have complete recovery. If it takes a few hours to get an occlusion open, you'll have partial recovery, which is variable depending on the collateral quality. And if you've got delayed opening, not only may you get no benefit, but you can also have an increased bleeding risk because reperfusion of dead brain is when you get uh, the risk of hemorrhagic transformation. The best measure of outcome is probably disability at three months. All the current trials would look at the modified Rankin scale. Hopefully you're all familiar with the Rankin scale going from zero where you're completely well to six dead and a very pragmatic, uh, clinically meaningful and patient meaningful uh, outcome scale. So I'm going to show you a preview of some of the stroke guidelines. Um, obviously these will be released in September um, 2017 and they're just going through NHMRC review at the moment. So they are still in the draft format but I'm going to give you a sneak preview. The recommendations for thrombolysis are very similar to the 2010 recommendations in that if you have a potentially disabling ischemic stroke and meet specific eligibility criteria, then a dose of 0.9 milligrams per kilogram of alteplase should be administered. And that has a strong recommendation level, which in our new grade classification, it's either strong or weak, rather than grade A, B and C evidence. It should commence as early as possible, but may be used up to four and a half hours because, as I'll show you, it's obviously a lot more effective at two hours than it is at four hours and 29 minutes. 
We've also got some practice points. These are not necessarily evidence-based, but they are certainly strong um, suggestions for how things are going to be giving you best quality care. So the interdisciplinary acute stroke care team with expert knowledge, streamlined workflow, including ambulance pre-notification, code stroke team response and direct transport from triage to CT scan. That's in the guidelines now as a strong uh, suggestion that uh, will improve your door to needle times and patient outcomes. The data collection element is also there. And then down the bottom we've got a little comment about consent because this is a, a vexed issue in some circles and obviously if you've got patient and caregivers who are competent they should be involved in the decision to give thrombolysis whenever possible and you document that discussion in the medical record. However, in the situation which occurs quite commonly where the patient's not competent and there aren't any relatives who are accessible within a meaningful time frame, then you should uh, give treatment as emergency therapy. And that's uh, something I'll come back to later on. So here's the famous time is brain curve. As you can see, the number needed to treat to get an excellent outcome increases from four and a half within 90 minutes to nine, up to three hours, and about 14 or 15 within the three to four and a half hour window. So time is absolutely critical. And the best bang we can get for our buck is to shift our patients up that curve by 15, 30, 45 minutes. How do we do that? Well. First of all, why do we want to do it? It's partly about the penumbra dying, but it's also probably about resistance to TPA. So there's some data which I've got on that slide there that the longer the clot's been wedged in the artery, the harder it is for TPA to dissolve it. And what you can see in this first 60 minutes is some spectacularly high rates of revascularization. You know, 62% of proximal middle cerebral artery occlusions dissolving at one hour uh, if you give TPA within 90 minutes. And that's not what we see in general practice, and that's the area where the mobile stroke unit may be particularly exciting. This is where we're at in Australia at the moment. And it is a sobering thought that we've been stuck at a 7% rate of thrombolysis since 2011. And it didn't get any better. There's an acute audit going on now. Maybe it will have shifted a bit, but uh, I'm not that optimistic that we're going to be shooting up the, the scale on thrombolysis. And if you think about the most active centres in Australia have rates over 20%. So there's a potential threefold increase in the number of patients who could get getting TPA. And then the second issue is, well, how well are we giving TPA? How fast are we giving TPA? And if you look at Australia, we're sitting at 26% of patients getting TPA within 60 minutes of hitting the door. And that's now lagging behind uh, the UK and the US quite considerably. So in the UK, they've, they've got their act together and they're treating 56% of their patients within the first hour of hospital arrival. So we do need to improve our game on the door to needle time. This message I hope you're all familiar with and I hope that you're going to go and swap as many of your friends and family and anyone else you can really get at to teach them this message because although it doesn't cover every stroke symptom, it covers the bulk of them. Uh, most people with stroke will have one of these symptoms. If they know to call triple O, that will get them in the pathway for accurate and timely treatment. So the very simple mantra on how to shrink door to needles is to prepare, to do as much as possible before the patient arrives and as little as possible afterwards, as Arthur said in Finland. Beautiful, succinct communication. So target stroke of giving you 10 points here that you might be able to do. And, and hospital pre-notification and a direct to CT uh, really is the core of this. There are other things, some of which are not relevant to Australia, like in America, if you mix up TPA and then you don't give it, you get it refunded, whereas we don't have that privilege. And when they applied that 10-point plan to America, across the country they shrunk door to needles by 15 minutes, which doesn't sound very much. But if you look at what it did in 70,000 patients, uh, you get highly statistically significant reductions in mortality, uh, increases in discharge home, increased discharge ambulatory, uh, reduced symptomatic hemorrhage, and reduced TPA complications. So it's a very good thing. It's certainly not a risky thing to treat faster. If anything, it's, it's a very strong uh, predictor of good outcome. So what can we do? Well, if you've got a name and date of birth, which is routine pre-notification in Victoria, you can create a hospital record if they don't have one already, or you can look up what existing records they do have if they've been to your institution before. You can get everything ready. Get the TPA out of the drug cupboard, depending on where that is in your place, clear the CT scanner, and meet the patient on arrival and go direct to CT, assessing them en route. You can assess limb power whilst you're willing the stretcher down to CT. So. Who does TPA work for? Well, the point of this slide is most people within four and a half hours. So you can see there that there's a strong effect within three hours. There's still a highly statistically significant benefit in three to four and a half hour window. 
whether you're under the age of 80 or over the age of 80 makes absolutely no difference to the benefit of treatment. It clearly makes a difference to your prognosis and we'll return to that time and time again across the presentation. Again, NIH score, the severity of the stroke doesn't affect the treatment effect, it does affect the prognosis and those are two separate issues to consider. Here's a very simple representation of what we do when we give someone TPA within three hours and you basically have a third of the patients significantly better off, a couple of the patients worse off mainly because of hemorrhage and then two thirds of the patients not really being a great deal different uh, whether you're given TPA or not. You can think about why that might be but it's predominantly that TPA either doesn't open the artery or there's no tissue left to save by the time you get to them. This is a more complicated way of splitting that graph so that you can see here now severity down the y-axis, mild, moderate and severe stroke and then placebo versus TPA within three hours versus three to four and a half hours. And you get the same picture that there's a benefit in all groups of severity. Um, the benefit is predominantly in the MRS zeros and ones in the mild stroke and predominantly in the twos and threes in the more severe stroke. Um, and you can see that the benefit is much greater within three hours than within three to four and a half hours. It's a useful thing to just uh, visualize that way perhaps. What is the risk? Well, the reason we all Think carefully before we give TPA, of course, is hemorrhage. Now, systemic hemorrhage is pretty rare in an appropriate screen patient. Uh, the traditional exclusions, which again I'll go through in a moment, are pretty conservative, and so we don't have big problems with systemic hemorrhage other than the occasional nosebleed or gum bleed or something like that. Symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage, of course, is the thing that can leave people disabled or dead. If you think about thrombolysis for heart attacks, um, there's a 1% rate uh, in the big meta-analysis from 2003 with STEMI thrombolysis. Now, of course, they give heparin as well on a higher dose of thrombolysis, so without heparin it's a little lower than that, but 1% is a good figure to keep in your mind. With stroke thrombolysis, the numbers vary a lot. So you've got the original NINS trial, which of course proved the benefit within three hours, 7% symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage. ECAS-3 in the three to four and a half hour, 2.4%, and SITS World well World Registry, 1.7%. So why is there such a huge variation? What is it? driving this variation or apparent variation in symptomatic hemorrhage rate. First thing is to think about most symptomatic hemorrhage is into the region of the stroke and a few are remote. And the remote ones are, are rare. It's usually that we've missed a subacute infarct because we haven't looked at the scan carefully enough and occasionally maybe they've got amyloid angiopathy or lots of cerebral microbleeds and, and maybe that underlies it. But the predominant risk of hemorrhage is into the area of stroke. And some bleeding into a stroke is natural history. So if you do scans on anyone untreated or treated a couple of weeks down the track from the stroke, you will find some degree of hemorrhagic transformation in most infarcts, especially if you do it with an MRI. So the definition of hemorrhage has evolved. Back in the early days of the NINS trial, any blood on the CT scan with any deterioration in neurological function was called a symptomatic hemorrhage. Very conservative, typical neurological approach. You know, if it could possibly be bad, we'll, we'll call it bad, uh, just to make sure we're not uh, overselling anything. And unfortunately, that's, uh, of course, caused issues in other fraternities. ECAS-2, they tightened it up a bit. It's still any blood, but you had to have at least a four-point increase in your stroke scale, and that sort of accounts for the, the wobbles that you can get from two people rating the NIHSS a few hours apart. The SITS definition um, uses a parenchymal hematoma type 2. So the blood clot has to actually take up at least a third of the infarcted territory and have some mass effect beyond just the infarct itself. And you had to have a four point increase in your NIHSS and it limited it to 36 hours after TPA because hemorrhages that occur after 36 hours have probably not got anything to do with TPA. It's well and truly out of the system by that stage. So basically the definitions evolved. Um, the symptomatic bleeding risk is also dependent on the population, so more severe stroke have a slightly higher risk, and delayed reperfusion is really the key. So we want to get the artery open quickly if we're going to open it, not let it happen 12 or 24 hours later. This is uh, looking at the effect of these different definitions, so the large radiologic hematoma, the uh, radiologic hematoma plus a four-point increase or fatal intracerebral hemorrhage within seven days, the odds are all very similar and of course the absolute rates are different. So the pH2 is around 7%, sits most around 3.7 and fatal ICH 2.7%. If you look here at treatment delay, treatment delay actually doesn't affect the risk. It's, it's always tempting and I've just told you delayed reperfusion is a problem but what is important to remember is when we give TPA, 
and when the artery actually opens are two very different things and they're not particularly related. So um, that's why time of administration is not important, it's time of reperfusion that's important. Age doesn't affect the rate of hemorrhage. At least you know, in absolute terms there seems to be no significant difference in uh, the rate of symptomatic hemorrhage in younger versus older patients. The baseline stroke severity does affect um, again, here you've got an interesting phenomenon where the odds ratios are jumping around all over the place and that's simply because the risk of symptomatic hemorrhage in the placebo group is very low and it becomes somewhat random. So the odds ratio versus placebo jumps around, but you can see here the absolute rate uh, increases steadily as you get more severe strokes, which is fortunate because if mild strokes had the same risk as a severe stroke of symptomatic hemorrhage, they have a very different benefit profile and that wouldn't favour treatment, but in fact the risk and benefit go in parallel across the spectrum of severity, which makes it easier. So here are some examples of symptomatic hemorrhage. This is actually all the 22 symptomatic hemorrhages that were called in the NINS trial. That's what gave you the 6.4%. And they're very different. If you just look at them there, you can see that these first two look particularly bad up the top left here. Um, they are actually in the placebo group. So it, you can have a symptomatic hemorrhage without giving TPA and it can be life-threatening or fatal as those cases were. Now if you look at the others, about half of them are pretty minor areas of blood in relation to big infarcts. I mean, yes, there's a moderate amount of blood here, but it's patchy and the infarct is the entire MCA territory. Likewise here, very large infarct, small amount of blood, no mass effect. So these things would not be called symptomatic hemorrhage with modern definitions of symptomatic hemorrhage and that applies to about half the cases. And that's why there's this difference between the NINS definition and the SITSMOTES definition. Um, there are also quite a few remote infarcts, more than we would see in current clinical practice. And again, you know, CT scans have improved a bit and our knowledge of reading CT scans has improved a bit. And I think we don't see as many remote hemorrhages now, probably because we notice the subacute infarcts that weren't noticed previously. Um, and the other point, of course, is that most of the patients who develop a life-threatening symptomatic hemorrhage had a life-threatening stroke. So it's very rare for us to take someone with a mild stroke and give them a life-threatening hemorrhage, fortunately. Now, in the real world, what's happening? That's all very well in trials, but what's happening in the real world? Well, to get with the guidelines, massive numbers of patients, variable definition of SITCH, but they're sitting around 5% and 9% you know, hospital mortality, but in the US they boot most of their patients out before they die, so that's not an accurate reflection of mortality. In Europe, 1.7% symptomatic hemorrhage, 11% mortality. It's telling you that most death is due to bad stroke, not due to symptomatic hemorrhage. Management of symptomatic hemorrhage. Well, I have to put in a caveat about this slide in that I'm yet to have a symptomatic hemorrhage where we can do anything about it because the reality is most of them are several hours after the TPA. So this idea of giving cryoprecipitate is all very well from theoretical principles that you're depleting fibrinogen and so you should replace it, but um, I'm yet to have an opportunity to try to use cryoprecipitate because the only symptomatic hemorrhages which are pretty rare to start off with have been many hours down the track. Um, maybe surgical evacuation perhaps. Um, obviously it stopped the TPA if it's still running but it doesn't apply. So we're going to monitor people closely for deterioration in their neurological conscious state, new headache and vomiting. We're going to stop the TPA. We're going to go to a scanner and nine times out of ten you'll find that they've just got a headache or they've just vomited or there's something, nothing to do with a hemorrhage and you can continue the TPA. The number needed to benefit versus harm is something that comes up quite a lot and uh, what we're talking about here is an effect on the modified Rankin and the effect that we see is a net benefit. So if you've had a symptomatic hemorrhage, you are not going to get to a Rankin 01 or 02. And uh, so it already includes the effect of uh, symptomatic hemorrhage. So to have a separate number needed to harm, as some people like to do, is really double counting the effect. Um, certainly if you're worried about mortality, it's neutral at 90 days. Um, reducing mortality is not our primary aim in stroke, unlike STEMI, where they don't really have disability after STEMI. Um, so we're aiming at reducing disability. So there is a 2.3% excess death in the first week due to symptomatic hemorrhage. And that's offset by deaths in the disabled placebo treated patients in the next couple of months and by 90 days it's all evened out. And even in the IST3 trial, which was a population of extreme uncertainty if you like, the people at the margins of TPA benefit in the eyes of their investigators, um, at 18 months they had uh, some benefits and 3.6% non-significant reduction in mortality with TPA at three years, even in the IST population. So you can be comfortable that the long-term effects of TPA are well in the direction of benefit on mortality. 
despite that early upfront risk. And here's the Kaplan Meyer curve. You can see TPA lower mortality than standard care, and the curves are still diverging even out here at three years, which is what happens when you have more disability, people die faster. In the NINS trial, in that early window, and the sort of best patients, if you like, um, mortality always favoured the TPA group. It was never statistically significant, but to get that kind of 2% uh, difference in statistical significance, they needed over 5,000 patients in the AMI trial, so we've never really had that volume of patients in TPA trials because mortality is not what we're shooting for, we're shooting for reduced disability. There's the Rankin bars, zero to three hours, three to four and a half hours, and then greater than four and a half hours where we don't treat people. And you can see here that there is benefit across the spectrum. So there's no increase in nursing homes or deaths uh, in the early window or the four and a half hour window, uh, whereas once you start getting beyond four and a half hours, the deaths in the nursing homes do start to increase slightly uh, with elder players just balancing the benefit at the other end of the scale. So you would need to select patients if you were going to treat out here, which at the moment we haven't proven. I will also just add on that slide, um, you will note if you're looking carefully that the absolute rates of good outcome are actually higher in the three to four and a half hour window versus the three hour window, which might seem at superficial level to contradict what I said about the effect of TPA being greatest early. Uh, it's due to these patients being younger and less severe. And those are the two very strong prognostic factors with TPA. So I'm going to come back to this issue of consent because many stroke patients, as all of you know, are not competent to consent to treatment. They either can't talk or they can't really comprehend the, the detail of what you're trying to tell them. So we try to talk to them about the treatment. You may be able to get relative or care consent. Now the ethical validity of that can be argued, but uh, certainly if there are family members there, you want to get them involved in the treatment decision. There's an American Academy of Neurology ethics statement about if the patient lacks capacity and no proxy decision maker can be found after a reasonable effort, then the physician may administer the medication based on the principle of implied consent for emergency treatment. And that's exactly what we've written in our guidelines as well. Um, there uh, is one survey of quite a lot of patients, over 2,000 patients, elderly US patients, and 78% of them said, given a scenario of a decent MCA stroke, they would like to get TPA even if they can't consent for themselves. And to compare that with CPR, it was only 84% who said they'd say CPR. So essentially, uh, no difference in the preference between receiving TPA and receiving CPR in the case of an arrest. So I think we can give that as, a, as a, some evidence that patients would prefer to be treated than left in the corner. Now, practical stuff. What do we need to know to give TPA? First of all, you want to be confident that you have a potentially disabling ischemic stroke. If they're going to do brilliantly anyway, there's no point in treating them. That's rare. Um, onset needs to be within four and a half hours, and that's the last known well time. So if they've woken up, it's when they went to sleep. The premorbid quality of life, their potential recovery from the current stroke, as best as we can judge, uh, is nice to factor in if you can do that. It's, it's always hard uh, in the acute situation. And you need a CT scan showing no blood or established infarct. What if you're a VST site? When will you activate VST? Well, hopefully you're getting pre-hospital notification of suspected stroke patients. If you're not, you need to talk to your local ambulance crews because it is a statewide protocol. If the patient's uh, you know, arriving in the emergency department, you have the option to activate VST at any of these stages. And it really is up to you and how confident you are that this is likely to be a treatable patient. As VST neurologists, we do need a little bit of time to fire up the computer, stop whatever we're doing and get ready. So um, certainly I prefer to know, uh, as many sites do, we've got a patient, we're just taking them to CT, can you get ready to look at the CT once it's off? And, and that's perfect. Um, I think if you had a really high probability case getting pre-notified, I'd be happy to hear about it in the pre-notification phase. But, um, the reality is, unless you're going to point the camera at the patient as they're wheeling through the door, I'm going to have to see the CT and then look at them after the CT. So if you go direct to CT, that's the best thing. The accuracy of the last known well time is crucial to all our decisions, and the TPA window and ECO transfer time are something that you need to consider as well. So if someone's already at five hours and you're in Swan Hill, they're beyond the TPA window, there's no way they're going to get down um, to Melbourne in time for a clot retrieval, unless it's a basilar artery clot, which we might take up to 24 hours. There's the mapping. So think about where you are on that map, what your drive time is or what your flight time is, and where you think it would be reasonable uh, to be calling up about potential clot retrievals. 
So pre-hospital care, uh, there is a recommendation that ambulance services should pre-notify the hospital of suspected stroke patients where they may be eligible for reperfusion therapies. We've deliberately, deliberately not put in a time window because we know that will evolve over the years to come. There's also a recommendation that anyone who's been pre-notified should be met at the door and assessed by experienced whatever the stroke team is in your institution. So focus questioning. Last known well time within four and a half hours. Are they on anticoagulants, not just warfarin, but the um, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and the bigger trend that we have now to worry about? Any recent bleeding in the gut or urine? Any recent surgery or trauma? Any history of intracerebral hemorrhage? Premorbid function? And that's pretty much all you need to know. I don't really care about family history or some other thing that's um, going to be asked about later. Those are the key things you want to know. How do you establish the last known well time? Well. For the moment, we are stuck with four and a half hours, so you want to try very hard to put people within that four and a half hour window if you possibly can, which means you know, if they've woken up, did they get up to the toilet just before they got up or in the last few hours? Uh, did they use their phone? You can look at their call history. Uh, is there evidence they got dressed or ate a meal or something that pins them within four and a half hours? Um, and also just consider on the other side of the equation, would their current deficit prevent any of those things that you uh, have just assessed have occurred? Because um, you know, if, if, you know, if you just got mild speech disturbance and there was no one to talk to, you won't know where the onset time was. And people with non-dominant deficits have uh, anosognosia in some cases. They don't know that they've got a problem. Focused examination. This is not the tendon hammer and uh, scratching planters kind of examination. This is, is there a potentially disabling neurological deficit? You need to know in your mind what that would be for you. And for me, it's limb weakness, language disturbance, inattention, hemiopia. It's not so much a bit of sensation on its own or a bit of a facial droop on its own or a bit of slurred speech on its own. You're going to pursue that examination until you've got enough information that there's a treatable deficit uh, and then you can stop. So I'm not necessarily going to go through the entire NIHSS before I make my treatment decision if they've walked in the door and you can see they're looking off to the wrong side of space, they've got a dense hemiparesis, can't move, can't talk. You really don't need to examine much more than that and get them in the CT scanner. On the other end of the spectrum, when it's really mild, that's when you do need to consider very carefully that you have excluded all the potentially disabling deficits. And pitfalls are the patient looks great lying in the bed but can't walk when you get them up and people forget to walk the patient. Um, the great Aussie male who says, yeah, mate, I'm fine, and you think that's sufficient language examination and uh, social phrases uh, can be misleading. So make sure you quiz them a bit beyond that with their language skill. Uh, with brainstem strokes, you want to make sure there's no palatal weakness and other things that might be hiding and less obvious before you call it too mild to treat. We need to know the blood pressure. We need to know the blood sugar, which is fine just on the finger prick from the ambulance. Um, and think about red flags. So if someone's on anticoagulants, if someone's got petechiae or fresh scars or jaundice because they might have liver failure and auto-anticoagulated or they've got chest pain or hypotension, which is obviously uncommon in stroke and might raise things about cardiac disease and perhaps aortic dissection. Um, if there's no red flags, you don't need to wait for blood tests or a chest x-ray or an ECG or anything like that. You just get on and do the CT. So what are we looking for on the CT? Well, we're looking at thick section non-contrast to exclude blood and subacute infarction. And uh, it's important to look at the entire um, scan, not just the region of clinical suspicion, because there could be that left cerebellar subacute infarct that we're not thinking about because the patient was asymptomatic and uh, that may be a source of bleeding risk. Is there any loss of grey white differentiation? That's something that takes experience and to be honest if you can't see hypodensity then you don't have a contraindication. Um, the grey white differentiation is nice for uh, diagnostic confirmation and feeling good about yourself but it's not a contraindication to uh, TPA. We then look at thin slice sections and the reason for that is, is there a hyperdense artery? And if there's a hyperdense artery correlating with a clinical syndrome, um, that's an acute clot. And if it's in a big artery, then you're already starting to think about endovascular clot retrieval. And start thrombolysis now if it's clear cut. You don't need any more information than the basic clinical stuff I've told you about plus the non-con CT. But there are many situations um, and these days we go on and routinely get at least a CTA and in many centres, pretty much all the metro centres and increasing number of rural centres are doing CT perfusion as well. The benefit of CT perfusion and CTA is, is there a perfusion lesion or a vessel occlusion to give you a positive diagnosis of stroke, not migraine, not psychiatric, not Todd's paresis after a seizure. And if you've got mild stroke and you see a vessel occlusion or a perfusion lesion, that's extra impetus that this is one of those patients who might get worse and therefore deserves treatment.
when we're looking at CTP, if the core is large, whilst we may not exclude someone from therapy, we certainly wouldn't exclude them from TPA, uh, it is worth rechecking uh, the overall risk-benefit scenario and uh, it might clue you in that this is someone who may need a hemicraniectomy, for instance, uh, if that's something you're going to have to transfer out for. Is there a large mismatch? It gives you more confidence to treat if they're clinically marginal. So the frailer patient um, with great energy, you're still going to go and advocate for, whereas if they had a large core, you might say, OK, I'm not going to push the, push the boundaries on this one. So there's your non-con CT with a deep hypertensive hemorrhage. This is a little convexal subarachnoid, well worth looking for. It happens in amyloid angiopathy, presents just like a TIA. And it's one of the reasons we always do some sort of brain imaging in TIA to exclude this kind of embarrassing hemorrhage that you don't want to give antiplatelets to. And there's a subacute infarct. If you see that, it's very unlikely to be within four and a half hours. You need to go and re-question your onset time. There's a hyperdense artery in the middle cerebral. You're thinking about clot retrieval at this moment. And there's one in the distal M2, which is not amenable to clot retrieval, but tells you at least it's a stroke and a uh, perfect candidate for TPA. You've got very subtle grey-white loss of differentiation in the basal ganglia here and much less subtle loss of grey-white differentiation in the left anterior cerebral artery territory there. Thin slices make hyperdense arteries obvious. You look at this artery here, it's one millimetre of bright artery and four millimetres of dark CSF and the average is not bright, whereas here, very obviously hyperdense artery, uh, big clot eligible for endovascular clot retreat. Now there is some thought that, well, we should customise our imaging to the patient and that's all very well, but the reality is that a standardised protocol speeds things up and gives you better quality and familiarity. You get much less technical stuff-ups if you do the same thing every time. Um, the other point clinically is that tailoring doesn't make a lot of sense. You can't pick the vessel occlusions by clinical severity. There's data showing that even in very mild stroke, you know, NIH less than three, most of them TIAs in that Canadian data I put there, 10% of them had a large vessel occlusion. Um, and the ones who had the large vessel occlusion were the ones who had the stroke progression and deterioration subsequently. So it's an important group to identify. Do not exclude people from a CTA simply because they're mild clinical severity. Creatinine should also not delay or prevent a CT angiogram. If you need it, you should do it. And that's what the Royal Australian College of Radiologists also recommend. If you need contrast for a clinical indication, you should give it regardless of GFR. And if you post-hydrate the patient, the evidence is that you have very little, if any, chance of putting that patient in serious harm, certainly not needing dialysis or anything like that. So that's part of the college guidelines and it's part of our statewide endovascular clot retrieval protocol as well. And it's in the guidelines coming out later this year. The other thing is that the CT angiography should be the aortic arch, the cerebral vertex. There is no point stopping halfway down the neck because you can't see the carotid bifurcation. There's no point stopping halfway through the brain because you can't see the more distal occlusions that you want to know about. So imaging in the guidelines, we've said that everyone who is a potential candidate for reperfusion should have immediate brain imaging. Uh, that means you know, direct from CT, direct from triage where possible, and, and certainly within 60 minutes. Uh, we should be using thin slices if we're looking for, not, for hyperdense arteries, and uh, CT perfusion can be used to improve diagnostic and prognostic accuracy. Um, at the moment, we've got a recommendation that we shouldn't be using advanced imaging to identify people beyond standard time windows. Now I know that that is very likely based on trial results that have not been released yet to um, be out of date by the time we release the guidelines, but it does say at the moment outside the context of research you shouldn't be doing it. And with stroke and TIA, MRI is more sensitive. That's not saying you should be doing MRI up front in the emergency department, it's saying next day when you're trying to determine whether this is a TIA or a minor stroke or whether it actually was a stroke versus something else. Um, then MRI diffusion imaging is what you should be doing. And it can also give you clues to mechanism. If you see multi-territory specs of diffusion, you know you've got a central embolic source and you need to really chase atrial fibrillation. Vascular imaging, again, everyone who could be a candidate for endovascular thrombectomy, which as I said is not based on clinical severity, should have the aortic arch to cerebral vertex CT angiogram. Um, you can do a carotid Doppler if for some reason they've missed out on that up front. Uh, to talk about people who've got endarterectomy eligibility, but we're really encouraging strongly CT angiograph up front to really identify the entire cerebral vascular tree. You can see intracranial blockages, you can see uh, dissections and all sorts of pathology which you can't see on the carotid doppler, which really just gives you that couple of centimetres in the neck. So 
I have mentioned the potential for an increasing role of CT perfusion and uh, you know, certainly is becoming more widespread in Victoria particularly. Um, the DAWN trial you'll hear about later this year was testing endovascular thrombectomy within a 6 to 24 hour window in people who'd had favourable CT perfusion imaging using the RAPID software that some of you are familiar with. So that's pretty complex criteria about how old you were, how severe your stroke was and how big your core was, but the basic principle was small core and a decent clinical syndrome means that there's going to be salvageable tissue even in a delayed time window. And that trial has been stopped for positive results. We just don't know what the results are yet. Uh, importantly, as I said, CT gives you, CT perfusion gives you much greater diagnostic accuracy, which as a telemedicine doctor I can tell you is incredibly useful uh, to have that confidence that we are treating a stroke and not some sort of mimic because I don't have the hands-on feedback that even with the web conference you don't get the same feel for the patient as you do when they're in front of you. And as I said, also decision making for mild stroke. You know, the things that I agonise about, particularly in telemedicine, uh, you know, have I really been able to thoroughly exclude any of those subtle things? I can zoom in and try and look at the palate. I can zoom in and try and look at other things. But um, mild stroke, when there's a vessel occlusion or perfusion lesion, you feel much more confident treating. And potentially to better target transfer for clot retrieval as well. If we've got someone in one of the more far-flung passes of the state, uh, and it's going to take four or five hours to get them down to Melbourne, it would be really nice to know they had good collateral so that they have some hope of benefit when they arrive all those hours later. So I think as a resource thing, we probably also need to start doing it just to uh, reduce the number of futile transfers that we're doing. So what is CT perfusion? I'm going to flick over to a video here now and um, my friendly technical assistant, yes, thank you. Um, this is the raw data from CT perfusion. It's a very simple concept. You give a bolus of contrast and instead of doing one scan for the CT angiogram, you repetitively scan through the brain to track the passage of that contrast bolus. And this is an example of a right MCA stroke. You can see the contrast arrives in the left hemisphere normally and it's delayed in the right hemisphere in the MCA territory. And you can also see that here in the insular region, very little contrast is arriving. And what we do to make CT perfusion more easily interpretable is turn, turn these into maps. So time to peak, as you might imagine, is how long it took to get to peak concentration of the contrast. And you saw in that one that was very short in the left hemisphere, it was long in the right hemisphere in the MCA territory. That's what time to peak is telling us. There's delayed flow arriving by collateral pathways because the M1's blocked. I can't get blood through the middle cerebral, it's got to come through the ACA and the PCA by those uh, leptomeningeal collaterals over the surface of the brain. The other thing I pointed out was that insular region not getting very much contrast at all. If you did uh, an integration, so the area under the curve in this area, um, you'd see that bugger all contrast is arriving and that tissue is very likely to be dead. And if you were to do an MRI as we did in this research patient, um, you'd see the infarct on DWI matching very nicely with the reduced cerebral blood volume area on the CT perfusion. So you can tell what's likely to be dead, what's likely to be salvageable around that area, and think in your mind what of the patient's deficit might be reversible if you get the artery open quickly. So it's a very powerful diagnostic and prognostic tool. So to illustrate these examples, too mild to treat, in quest, quest, inverted commas and question mark, um, this guy had an NIH of three or four, depending on who examined him, who, whether they found the inattention or not. And that is at the borderline of some people's protocols, uh, whether you think that's worth treating or not. So here's his non-con, it's not particularly helpful. There's the CTA, and you can see here there's a distal M1 occlusion. This is flipped around the other way, but it's a right M1 occlusion. Uh, so this is someone who has a 30% chance roughly of deteriorating subsequently and so if you do the CT perfusion it makes it very obvious there's a major problem with perfusion in his right MCA territory. So we do the CTP before we do the CTA because it's a lot easier to say oh yes there's a lesion here than uh, struggling to find little branch occlusions in the MCA. Seizure and onset. One of the questions I got asked recently is seizure and onset a contraindication to TPA and the answer is no as long as you know it's a stroke and they haven't injured themselves uh, significantly in the seizure. So this is a guy who was actually on our ward, had a seizures referable to the right hemisphere and then had a stroke or at least a hemiparesis referable to the right hemisphere. What do you do? Well, you could say, well, it's a tosparesis or it's a stroke, we'll wait and see. Uh, but of course you miss the time window, you could ignore it because he's old, which you of course would not do after listening to this lecture. Uh, or you could use imaging. So non-con, again, very early, not going to be helpful, just excludes hemorrhage. 
CTA shows you the vessel occlusion, so at this point you know it's a stroke, and of course we would have got the CTP first, which shows that big problem with perfusion in the right MCA territory, and really very good collaterals. Um, so he's got a good prospect of recovery if you get the artery open quickly, despite being old. Question I face a lot, um, both in our own emergency department and telling medicine, is it actually a stroke? Um, you'd think it would be easy, and it's not. So typical you know, example I show of the 23-year-old girl, not a high pretest probability that this is going to be stroke, uh, but it happens. And we know that young people with stroke are often mislabeled uh, in the emergency department. So she's come in, she's crying. It's always not a good sign. Uh, she's trying to send an SMS. She really doesn't want to participate in the examination. And you also don't want to give this woman too much radiation if you don't need to. But there's a non-contrast CT. And, it would be very easy to walk past this little hyperdense artery here. Hopefully you'd be looking at the thin sections carefully and pick it, but um, I can tell you that it's a lot easier to know that this is a left MCA stroke when you've got the perfusion lesion showing it right there. And so uh, this is a way to actually speed up treatment. People talk about CTP delaying treatment, but particularly in these cases where you have diagnostic uncertainty, once you see that, you know what you're going to do. And uh, it actually reduces procrastination and can speed up treatment. The caveat, of course, there's always a downside, is that lacuna strokes don't show particularly well on CTP. And this is an example of someone who had a slightly odd examination, and we did a CTP, and it was normal, and we thought, oh, yeah, it's functional, but got an MRI. And sure enough, there's this pretty large, actually, uh, lacuna lesion in the thalamus, and, and thalamus can do funny things to people's psychiatry, so it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. So CTP doesn't exclude lacuna infarction. In terms of getting patients treated quickly, trimming unnecessary roadblocks, age doesn't matter, seizure at onset doesn't matter if you can demonstrate it's a stroke and no other injuries, aspects doesn't matter, um, functional status given the benefit of the doubt and emergency consent for treatment. The contraindications to TPA are many and varied. The reality is most of them are about have they taken an anticoagulant and have they had recent bleeding or surgery and the other things are you know, optional. Some of these can be got around by um, clot retrieval. But obviously, if that's not on site, you have to think about whether you can give TPA. Blood pressure management is a question I often get asked. We have this arbitrary number of 185 and 110, which uh, you know was plucked out of the air. We don't want to get it majorly below that. That's why I've used the word nudge. Just want it down to the 180 mark, and then you can start the TPA and just keep it there. Labetalol, hydralazine, whatever you like to use, doesn't matter um, to get it down. Certainly with intracerebral hemorrhage, we target 140. Um, there was a recent ATT&CK2 trial which showed that going to 120 wasn't beneficial, in fact had more kidney side effects, so we don't go lower than 140. Other issues to think, you know, if they've had gastrointestinal bleeding, is it now secured? If they've had an aneurysm, is that now secured with clips or coils? Um, you know, recent surgery, talk to the surgeon. They may be comfortable with you giving TPA. In fact, they usually are, and you have to just then think about whether that's really a wise thing to do or not. Um, aortic dissection does have a risk of death with TPA. It's best not to do that. Um, pregnancy, think about risks and benefits of um, placental hemorrhage versus the stroke. Um, you know, there are plenty of people who've had TPA in pregnancy. Well, when I say plenty, there's at least 35 in a series which uh, didn't have any negative consequences. So um, you can get away with these things. DOACs um, are difficult. We know that you know, the guidelines say INR up to 1.7 is OK with warfarin. We don't have an equivalent level for the DOACs. There are some direct uh, tests of DOAC activity, which you might like to use. And of course, with the bigger trend, there is this reversal agent. And the theory, at least, is that you can give the reversal agent and then give TPA immediately afterwards. On-site endovascular, you've got to think about how long it gets to the tests for the anticoagulant versus just going direct to uh, angio suite. So you put it together, they've got a last known well time within four and a half hours, they've got a treatable deficit consistent with stroke, they've got no bleeding risk contraindication, they've got blood sugars are okay, blood pressure is less than 185 or 110, you've got non-con CT, exploding blood and established hypodensity, it means treat now and don't relax until the infusion's running. The tough life is five minutes, so there's no point giving the bolus and stuffing around for 10 minutes whilst you get the infusion ready because you've just wasted the whole point of the bolus, you never get it up to the necessary concentration. So this is how we recommend you make up TPA. It's a 50 mil vial because that's got the nice little transfer cannula and it's really quick to make up. You can worry about calculating the rest of the dose later.
So you make it up in a 50 ml syringe, purge the volus out of the syringe driver and start the infusion immediately with the same syringe uh, is the quickest way, having tried many ways of doing this, to achieve TPA administration fast. The dose question has come up. There was this trial led by Craig Anderson in Sydney using low dose TPA. To cut a long story short, it was aiming to show non-inferiority as in preserving at least 50% of the treatment effect of 0.9 milligrams per kilogram, which is a pretty low bar if you think about it. I'd like to have more than 50% of the TPA effect preserved. And it didn't even meet that non-inferiority criterion. So the editorialist, Kathy Siler from Cleveland, uh, said there is no compelling evidence for using low-dose aldoplase in anyone, and I agree with that. And that's what the guidelines will say as issue as well. Tenecteplase you'll hear about. I don't want people to be using tenecteplase randomly. It's certainly a very different dose than you would use for a heart attack and you don't give concurrent heparin. There are people in New Zealand who've died because they've been given the STEMI dose of tenecteplase for strokes. That's not a good idea. Um, there is this trial called Nortest, which is reporting next month using a slightly higher dose than what we're using in our Australian trials. So just stay tuned for tenecteplase, but we're not there yet. Endovascular. Well, you know these five trials and there have been a couple since. Basically, they were about getting the artery open fast and properly and uh, some imaging selection, at least having a vessel that was blocked on the initial imaging. The solitaire stent retrieve is one of the ways to unblock an artery. You put the stent into the artery, uh, let it incubate for a little while, and then pull it out under negative pressure aspiration. And that negative pressure aspiration is really important to prevent bits of clot flicking up into the cerebral circulation. It is also a time-dependent therapy. You can see a number needed to treat to be one better on the ranking goes from 2.3 down to 8.6 at about seven and a bit hours the window expires. So certainly we treat to six and if they arrive a little bit later we you know, fudge it a little because there's clearly benefit beyond that. And even out here that odds ratio is two, so that's greater than the TPA effect ever is, even at the expiration of the endovascular window. So I think it's a, a very powerful therapy that will no doubt expand beyond that time with imaging selection based on these dawn results. Where can the interventions get to? Internal carotid, first part of the middle cerebral, just into the second part called the M2, but beyond that it's getting pretty tortuous and small and it becomes uh, more risk for less reward because TPA works better up in those smaller arteries, there's less territory at risk to save um, and it's never really been proven in that area. The basilar artery of course is not on that angiogram and there are no randomised trials in basilar artery yet, there are some ongoing, but we do treat open label uh, out to potentially 24 hours. Age, prognostic but not treatment effect modifying is the summary of this. So you can see the younger you are the better your outcome and if you are treated you do better than if you're left alone and that the elderly patients still do better if treated than if left alone. Same with clinical severity, parallel lines of equal treatment effect across clinical severity. Um, mild strokes do better than severe strokes on average but uh, they do better if you treat them than if you leave them alone. This is a complicated figure. I just want to show you, this is some hot off the press data, that for any volume of core on CT perfusion, you can look at the age and you can look at the time from when you got the imaging to when they're going to be reperfused. And if you're Swan Hill, you're going to be down this end of the curve. And the proportion of patients getting an independent outcome. So anything blue is a pretty low rate of independent outcome. You can see once you're getting into big cores, you've got to be super young and super fast to get a good outcome. Whereas at the small cores, you can be quite old and quite late and still get a good outcome out of it. And I think that's the message I want to say with this slide. It's not just about age, it's not just about time, it's about that and core all mixed into a complex equation that we're going to need to come to grips with. So to summarise endovascular, um, we want to consider it in all patients with a major vessel occlusion of the ICA, M1, basilar and perhaps M2s. Um, we want to think about it whether they're eligible or ineligible for TPA. Those two treatments decisions are entirely independent and should be occurring in parallel with neither one uh, delaying the other. They need to have good pre-morbid function. It's a resource intensive procedure. And <clears throat> we want to uh, not apply age or clinical severity limits. So it's all about the patient's biological age, if you like, not their chronological age. At the moment we've got this six hours to start the procedure. That will almost certainly extend with Dawn and other trials which are coming through the works, but using imaging selection. Basilar time window, some people say 24 hours from last known well, others say nine hours from coma. Um, it's an individualised decision we'll discuss uh, case by case. <clears throat> CT perfusion, as I've said, is really helpful to characterise how much is likely to be dead already. 
to prognosticate and have that crystal ball for what the brain's likely to look like <clears throat> in several hours when they arrive from a, a rural site. And know how to arrange transfer if you haven't got it available on site. For, for all of you, that's a triple O call, with the exception of Albury, who have uh, New South Wales, Victoria jurisdictional issues, and uh, not ambulant, not adult retrieval unless the neurologist specifically tells you that that's what we want. So we only use adult retrieval if there's an airway problem or some major um, comorbidity that's not a straightforward stroke. So there's the guideline for thrombectomy, fairly straightforward, and room for wriggles uh, beyond six hours in selected patients and more distal occlusions in selected patients. And there's a lot of practical info, so when you do see the guidelines, have a read of the practical info on TPA and thrombectomy because there's a lot of uh, useful stuff in there. So I'm now going to quickly cover some secondary uh, prevention elements in the last 10 minutes or so. TIA is an emergency. I think you've probably all got that message by now. We want a CT brain because occasionally there are those small tumours or bleeds that are not TIA and we need to exclude them before we give antiplatelets and anticoagulants. Carotid imaging, as I said, CT angiogram up front gives you a lot more information than a Doppler and in most situations that's the best test. If you haven't uh, got CT angiogram available and you can do a Doppler, that's fine. It will tell you about endarterectomy suitability. It just doesn't tell you about anything else. 12 lead ECG for atrial fibrillation, but of course that's the tip of the iceberg. AF comes and goes and we need to be constantly mindful of checking that and rechecking that as the patient goes through their journey. What are the key management steps? Well, start an antiplatelet unless you're going to anticoagulate them because of AF. Commence a high potency statin and oral hypertensives before the patient leaves your site because that strategy reduces stroke by 80% after TIA. Now, of course, that's resource dependent, but um, work on your local system so that people are not waiting a week for their carotid ultrasound and getting their meds. This is an example of MRI and TIA and how it's redefining what we call stroke and TIA. Clinically normal, two very brief episodes, but stroke on imaging. And that's the definition now. If you've got brain infarction on an MRI, that's a stroke, not a TIA. Not for insurance purposes, but for medical purposes. And clearly this is a much higher risk syndrome than someone had two episodes of dysphasia due to migraine. Um, there are the recommendations for TIA. We're actually recommending against the use of ABCD squared uh, in isolation because it tends to miss, um, or tends to classify some people at low risk despite AF and carotid stenosis. So we don't want to do that. And there's a lot of practical info again on how to distinguish TIA from other things because we think that's the best way to resource, uh, make our efficient use of resources, is making a proper diagnosis rather than randomly risk stratifying people with an invalid tool. So the investigations determine the preventive strategy. The most important thing is AF because it changes our strategy from antiplatelet to, to anticoagulation. Uh, Carotid vascular imaging, as I said, CTA has a lot of advantages. Um, diffusion MRI, not right up front in the emergency department, but over the next few days really gives you a lot of information about stroke mechanism as well if you see multi-territory dots. Cardiac investigations, it's mostly about AF. The echocardiography is relatively low yield. There are particular situations where it's very helpful. Uh, Transesophageal is better for valves, transthoracic is better for left ventricle. We find PFOs and you have to work out what to do about them and uh, AF monitoring, as I said, really, really crucial. Young strokes, definitely do the CTA, definitely do the transesophageal echo. There are blood tests. It's predominantly about the antiphospholipid screen with arterial emboli, unless you think there's a mechanism for paradoxical uh, embolism like a PFO or some other sort of intracardiac shunt. Uh, Fabries is something we just need to keep on the radar, and there are free screening tests through the companies that make the enzymes to, to look for Fabries in young stroke patients with no other cause. Blood pressure lowering, we don't talk about hypertension, we talk about absolute risk, and so anyone who's had a stroke is at high absolute risk and should have their blood pressure lowered if they can tolerate it, and essentially we want it lower the better, as long as they're not getting symptomatically hypotensive. Stroke guidelines talk about uh, the blood pressure there, I'll just skip over that in the interest of time. Statins, um, high potency statins again with the absolute risk approach, people who've had a stroke with a potential atherosclerotic contribution should be on either 80 of a 12 or 40 of a suva as the high potency statins. That's where the evidence for stroke reduction is not 10 milligrams of simvastatin, which is a much weaker drug. The antiplatelets we use, still aspirin first line a lot. Aspirin dipyridamol is slightly better and clopidogrel is slightly better than aspirin, but obviously restricted by PBS uh, limitations. 
there are a few people in whom we use dual antiplatelets short term. Long term dual antiplatelets, aspirin and clopidogrel, uh, the bleeding risk definitely outweighs the benefit. There are some people, uh, particularly in that Chinese chance trial with intracranial atherosclerosis, who benefit a lot from aspirin and clopidogrel for a short time. Um, for AF, we've gone in favour of uh, direct oral anticoagulants over warfarin for people with uh, non-valvular AF, and there's a definition of valvular AF which we've gone with the European Society of Cardiology, which is basically only people with a mechanical prosthetic valve or moderate to severe mitral stenosis. So that's actually pretty rare. Most people with atrial fibrillation by this definition have non-valvular AF and are there eligible for DOAX, and you just need to create, uh, calculate the creatinine clearance via cockroft galt uh, to be accurate about what their renal function is. So there are some messages about anticoagulation. It is unutilised. Uh, we need to give more of it. Um, we often tend to prioritise the bleeding risk over preventing stroke, which is not necessarily how the patients think. And uh, we have a bit of age discrimination as well. So the risk of stroke in AF goes up with age, and yet the rate of anticoagulation goes down. And Aspirin is actually not a benign drug in the elderly, so we don't uh, want to be discriminating on that basis. Now, would you use warfarin or a DOAC? Well, valvular AF, so mechanical prosthetic valves or moderate to severe mitral stenosis still needs warfarin. You need creatinine clearance over 30 for a DOAC other than 25 for a pixaban. And uh, you know, overall, if you look at DOACs as a group, there's slightly less ischemic stroke an important reduction in intracellular hemorrhage and a convenience advantage. And of course, there's a reversal agent for dibigatran that's not quite there on the market yet for some of the other drugs. We don't want to be using aspirin for AF. Okay, So in the meta-analysis of aspirin effectiveness, uh, it was not significantly beneficial. So the Averroes trial compared pixaban versus aspirin in people who couldn't take warfarin and showed not only a major reduction in stroke, but no increase in major bleeding. So that's really killed aspirin for atrial fibrillation. If you can't use anticoagulation, or if you can't use a pixaban particularly, uh, then you really shouldn't be using aspirin because it's no safer and it doesn't work. There's a big problem in uh, Australia and around the world that we tend to use the lower dose of these formulations and compromise efficacy in the sort of uh, perverse way to try and save bleeds, which is not the thing to do. So please do read the product information and use the correct dose of the anticoagulant that you've chosen. When to start after stroke is a big problem and there is no evidence to guide us. So um, you know, we talk about immediate for TIA once you've excluded hemorrhage, three to six days in a moderate sized stroke because the bleeding risk is less than a big stroke, which might take 10 to 14 days to start. And you might want to repeat a CT before you do start to exclude major hemorrhagic transformation. Perioperative management I'll just highlight as something that we need to be more aware of because there are too many strokes that occur because someone was taken off their DOAC a week before just as they would have for warfarin and that's not how you manage perioperative uh, issues with DOACs. We need to make sure blood pressure is optimally controlled, avoid concurrent antiplatelets. Most people with ischemic heart disease do not need an antiplatelet alongside their DOAC. Uh, the DOAC is perfectly adequate unless you've got fresh stents, and that's the only real reason to have a concurrent antiplatelet. You need to monitor the creatinine clearance, they're not entirely monitoring free. And uh, that's just one more slide here on end arterectomy. You know the evidence, 70 to 90 percent, very, very strong evidence of benefit, 50 to 70 percent, some benefit if you've got a low surgical morbidity and a good life expectancy, and once it's occluded or trickle, uh, the risk of stroke goes down, and you don't need to treat those patients, and asymptomatic carotids um, Surgery is rarely indicated, probably never really. So to conclude, thrombolysis implementation is still suboptimal. We're stuck with a low percentage of patients treated and a very low percentage of patients treated adequately fast enough. So we need to be better on that. Our ECR system and eligibility are still evolving, so watch this space for extensions in time window and the types of clock we can retrieve. I would really advise people to get in on the CT perfusion bandwagon. It's very useful for rural sites. It's all happening in metro and it's happening at some of the rural sites, but um, it is not difficult for the radiographer. It's actually easier to perform than a CT angiogram because there's no timing required. Um, the radiation dose is acceptable and it's uh, very helpful diagnostically, prognostically and in making appropriate transfers. What we do in terms of investigation for etiology really determines the prevention strategy, and AF is the particular thing that's underdiagnosed and undertreated. We have a preference for DOACs, but you need to be familiar 
with how to use them properly to maximise their efficacy and safety. And so with that, I will give you my email address if you have any questions, um, give you some homework, so to review your stroke protocol and check if it aligns with guidelines. There's often extraneous contraindications that have crept in. Um, review your workflow. How can you trim off a few minutes from uh, your door to needle time? Make sure your family and friends at least know the fast message and befriend your local media. I'm particularly talking to rural sites here. You're going to have a local newspaper and they'll love to get some good news stories about your successful cases and you can slip in the fast message and really improve your community's awareness of stroke. Finally, the Inform Me website, if you don't have a login, get one because you can look at your own hospital's data and, uh, and work out how you're tracking with door to needles and the guidelines will be on that site. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to go to questions. We have only a couple of questions by the looks of it. So, looking at bypassing ED, does anyone have a pathway protocol they use on patient selection? Sorry, I'm having real trouble actually reading um, the question. Can anyone help me to make this bigger? So Lizzie Dodd just says, we are looking at bypassing ED. Does anyone have a pathway protocol they use on PT selection, monitoring they can share? Yeah, so I'm not sure when you mean bypassing ED when you're talking about just going direct to CT or going direct up to a ward. What we do is very much triage to CT scan. Then we sit in a resuscitation cubicle whilst the lysis is running and then go up to the ward currently. And I think that works well. I wouldn't like to suggest that we completely um, bypass ED. I think there are advantages in having ED buy-in. Um, it's just a matter of um, balancing that. Direct to CT from arrival, yeah. So I'm happy to share that. Just contact me offline about direct to CT pathways. Now, Danny's asked about secondary prevention and adherence drops over time. Um, you know, why, how do we pres preserve that? And this is a problem with resources, really. I would love to see people in our stroke prevention clinic more than just the one three-month visit, but we don't really have space and time to do that. So I think it does require physician engagement. We need to get the GPs to do that role, and, and maybe we can um, take a greater role ourselves later on with more resources. But um, it's really making sure at that discharge summary level that um, the patient knows and the GP knows this is not just when the script runs out, you can stop, it's forever, and it needs to be monitored and the blood pressure meds titrated, and it's a really active process. I think we've exhausted the questions. Is there anything else that's going to pop up? Yes, so a uh, question about DOAX and aspirin. If you do not have a stent, you do not need a separate aspirin for your ischemic heart disease and a DOAC for your, um, for your ischemic heart disease. So in the early days, they did trials of aspirin versus warfarin for plain old ischemic heart disease. And warfarin was actually better than aspirin. It just caused more bleeding, and so it wasn't favoured. Um, but warfarin is perfectly good for treating ischemic heart disease. And the presumption is that uh, DOAX would also be fine for ischemic heart disease. So, you know, if the patient's got a cardiologist, talk to them. If they've got active ischemic heart disease and angina, that may be a slightly different situation. But for the majority of patients where you see on their discharge summary history of ischemic heart disease, you do not need to have them on aspirin and DOAC. And the risk of bleeding is substantially increased if you do that. Okay, I think we might leave it there. Thanks very much for your attention. Please do put in your uh, feedback and uh, all the best.